Disclaimer, in this video I will be talking about things related to the LGBT community and I will often be using the term queer instead of LGBT or any other derivative because that is how I personally choose to identify and is a term I prefer. If you do not enjoy the use of this term, then please don't watch this video. I'd also like to say that when I discuss women in this video, I am not talking exclusively about cis women. It's none of my business. My point is, TERFs, please do not interact with this. Do you ever watch something for the first time and are left blown away by its nuance? Like, this wasn't something you were even looking forward to initially, maybe you were even avoiding it, and then you do watch it and it surprises you on every level, and this thing that you were so sure you were going to find objectively not for you turns into a mini masterpiece in front of your eyes, and things you thought could never be done were made possible by those you thought couldn't possibly be capable. Party's over, you pieces of shit! Anyway, I love the Harley Quinn animated series and it is the best thing DC have made in years. Hello, my name is Mage, and welcome to Black and White Thinking. As I was saying, the Harley Quinn animated series is really good. It's stupid, it's funny, it has heart, it has Alan Tudyk as Clayface, and it finally lets Harley and Ivy raw dog each other like they're supposed to. Side note one, this show should have been called Harley and Ivy, that would have made much more sense, but whatever. Anyway, beyond its gayness and entertainment value, the Harley Quinn animated series stood out to me. The manic pixie dream girl of your nightmares who has been obsessed with Harley since her first appearance in the Batman animated series when I was a child as like, it was really shockingly good. Now this pains me to say a little, but I think the Harley Quinn animated series is the best Harley content we might have ever received. I love Margot Robbie and the things she has done for a live action Harley are incredible, but she has yet been given the opportunity to shine and Harley's character in the DC live action films has suffered for this. Animated Harley went through a broader character arc in one episode than live action Harley has had over two film appearances. And don't even get me started on Harley in the comics. I'll be here for hours discussing DC's homophobia and ableism and how much I hate Jimmy and Amanda, and no one wants to hear that. The Harley Quinn animated show is everything everyone wanted to see from Margot Robbie's live action Harley. Everything we have been deprived of within Harley's comic runs. And it was all set to the backdrop of a drunk gym. It was dope. However, in my feeble bisexual opinion, the real reason the Harley Quinn animated show was steps ahead of all other Harley content was because it is, like, queer feminist literary shit. You two hooked up. What? No! Me? Her? No! Never! Stop denying it. What Compet is? According to Adrienne Rich, the person who popularised the term in a 1980s essay comparing four feminist texts, it is the understanding that heterosexuality is a political institution inflicted on women by men, and not an innate sexuality human beings are born with. The term was used in an essay of Rich's in relation to the framing and analysis of feminist media, and although the phrase hadn't yet been coined by Kimberley Williams Crenshaw at the time, it concentrates on the intersectionality of queer theory and feminist theory. The essay discusses how feminist texts often other queer women when they choose to ignore them, or see their existence as lesser than that of women that are assumed to be, or identify as, heterosexual. The consequences of compulsory heterosexuality, according to Rich, are felt by real women all over the world, and therefore should be reflected within feminist analysis, with women of colour, especially those who are bisexual and lesbian, suffering the most from these misrepresentations, ideals and restrictions. Essentially, the assumption that all women are innately heterosexual is inherently oppressive and it means that women quite often never even consider whether or not they could be attracted to women, or even if they want to spend more time in the company of women instead of in the company of men, or they are unable to acknowledge that they feel safer and more secure in other women's company because the world they live in is so phallocentric. In her essay, Rich comments, My organising impulse is the belief that it is not enough for feminist thought that specifically lesbian texts exist. Any theory or cultural political creation that treats lesbian existence as a marginal or less natural phenomenon as mere sexual preference, or as a mirror image of either heterosexual or male homosexual relations, is profoundly weakened thereby, whatever its other contributions. Feminist theory can no longer afford merely to voice a toleration of lesbianism as an alternative lifestyle, or make token allusion to lesbians. A feminist critique of compulsory heterosexuality orientation for women is long overdue. I am suggesting, she says, that heterosexuality, like motherhood, needs to be recognised and studied as a political institution. What Compet is not? Compet is not a Google Doc made by Tumblr users who don't even cite the name of the essay or the writer who popularised the phrase. A Google Doc that might be the worst thing to happen to queer women's spaces on the internet since the invention of Swan Queen. If you, if you do not know the Google Doc I am referring to, please consider yourself saved.
So what has a piece of feminist, lesbian, literary analysis from the early 80s have to do with the Harley Quinn animated series? Well, kind of everything, if you ask me. The Harley Quinn animated series is some of the best queer media I've seen in a long time that approaches the bisexual sapphic experience with any real level of depth, giving a so raw I might actually be triggered right now look at how the relationships between women, romantic, platonic or familial, are deeply affected by the men around them, at how women struggle to cultivate and maintain these relationships when women have been trained since birth to consider men before all things, even in women-only spaces such as sapphic relationships. The show managed to zoom in on how women have been quite frankly so well brainwashed by our male overlords that we can disregard our own happiness and capacity for love and prioritise theirs. How women are so innately affected by the patriarchy that we can literally be standing next to the love of our life or our next big career opportunity or insert any power move dream here and be entirely blind to it as if our view was literally blocked by a never ending wall of cock. It's just another heavy-handed female empowerment story where the true villain is the quote-unquote patriarchy. Honestly, this show was so good, I can almost forgive it for its use of the monosexist love triangle trope, because some of the betrayals were handled so well. The Harley Quinn animated series definitely feels like half a story at this point, but it is half a story better than all other Harley content, and honestly, a lot of queer media in general. Now, don't get me twisted, the Harley Quinn animated series isn't the piece de resistance of queer media, or women loving women representation, like they haven't even said the word bisexual yet. However, for a show whose audience is going to be full of more, let's say, normies than the Birds of Prey movie, and especially things that would be considered capital L lesbian media, it managed to portray a message that I often find missing from women loving women, specifically bisexual narratives. And as I said, that being the toxic nature of male influence on the relationships between women. In relation to Harley and Ivy, this can be seen in on-the-nose violent misogyny, fetishization, or accepting a miserable future with the most boring man on the planet in the pursuit of unachievable normalcy and acceptance within a patriarchal culture instead of happiness with a perceived social deviant. And I really don't think any of this is personal assumption or sapphic projection on my part. There is clear textual evidence in the Harley Quinn animated series of the effects of compet on the characters of Harley and Ivy, and this provides us with a modern and fun piece of media which we can use as a lens to examine Rich's essay. And well, I just want to talk about Harley and Ivy, so that's what we're going to do. Episode 1, the Setup. The first episode of the Harley Quinn animated series is a good one, and personally one of my favourites, choosing to establish a solid baseline for the show's themes, character arcs and aesthetic. By focusing on Harley coming to terms with her abusive relationship with Joker, with the help of Ivy, the show was initially able to establish the following things that I personally think indicated where the rest of the show was heading, and what it felt was important for us as an audience to grasp early on. 1. Ivy is in love with Harley. 2. Whilst in an abusive relationship with Joker, Harley segregates herself and sidelines all other relationships in her life, including the one she has with Ivy. 3. Both Harley and Ivy crave the comfort of social acceptance, even though they are both so-called bad guys. In Rich's essay, she discusses what she calls the assumption of female heterosexuality and its effects on women. It is essentially her understanding of how a relationship between a man and a woman requires little to no explanation, but a relationship between queer women often does. This is common for all queer relationships in the real world. Everyone always interested in how you knew and if it's different. This assumption of heterosexuality and its casual acceptance, this need to constantly explain and justify queerness, can often leave women internalising these differences and blinding themselves to the depth and worth of their relationships that they have with other women, often not even considering a world where they could have real, meaningful, romantic or platonic relationships with other women because they are so focused on their relationships and worth in relation to men or men all the time, whether that be through the relationships they have with their fathers, brothers, husbands, sons, or the relationships we women as a whole have with the culture we grow up in, a culture that no matter where you live in in the modern world is almost exclusively controlled and influenced by men. This inherent blindness to possibility and to a life lived by one's own ideals is most obviously present in the titular Harley, and this is laid out clear as day in the first episode. And don't say you don't know him like I do. Harley someone who considers herself society's literal enemy, is still obsessed with its acceptance, desperate to find any justification for Joker and his terrible behaviour, even rewriting parts of her own psyche to do so. Harley is so blinded by this want for normalcy that she pursues an abusive relationship with the Joker instead of a much healthier one with Ivy, who is quite literally standing in front of her fulfilling the quota of things Harley wants from the Joker. Respectful partners in crime, respect generally, saving her from Arkham. Harley even says, he literally 
made me who I am today. Which is embarrassing. No man has ever made a woman. Don't be gross, Harley. This is one of the consequences of compat and heteronormative society in general, where women are left open to abuse by men because they find no safety in other women. Heterosexuality and the idea that women need men in their life is projected on everyone since birth, whereas relationships between women and all queerness is painted as deviant and questionable. In a world where women and their connections with each other are labelled this way, men have the perfect tool to oppress us. Eternal reliance on men themselves. As Helene Sissou said in her mind-blowing essay, The Laugh of Medusa, which you should all read, men have committed the greatest crime against women. Insidiously, violently, they have led women to hate women, to be their own enemies, to mobilise their immense strength against themselves, to be the executants of their virile needs. Ivy is doing the work here, being the supportive structure Harley needs in her life, and Harley gives us the finest example of the consequences of compet in her inability to see any of this, because it's not like Ivy is trying to hide any of this. See, Ivy never really hides how she feels about Harley from Harley. She just doesn't trust Harley or herself with those feelings. Ivy is explicit in her affection and her devotion to Harley. She is a good friend, and she often specifically juxtaposes herself with the Joker. All I'm saying is, is that you can do way better than Joker. So the first episode sets up this cycle of Harley chasing Joker. Desperate for his attention, love, or respect, depending on the day, and Ivy, and well, literally everyone, That yeah. is just one person's opinion. He's, He's not, not coming. coming! Telling her that Joker is the worst, and Harley ignoring them all, and neglecting her friendship with Ivy because of this obsession. Side note two, this shows use of Joker Batman as, as a foil to Harley Ivy and the whole Harley was blind to the love between Joker and Batman is on the nose and clever and I love it. Moving on. By the end of the first episode, Harley has begun to see her relationship with Joker for what it is and was, when Harvey literally forces Joker's hand and has him publicly admit that he loves Batman more than Harley. I mean, Joker doesn't love anyone, but it works, so whatever. And here is where the truth of Harley's situation lies, and the compet metaphor continues. When Joker tries to kill Harley at the end of the episode, she is reminded that he has tried to kill her before. Harley, so compounded and traumatised by her experiences with Joker, so blinded by her need for a nice normal relationship with a nice normal man, creates false memories to block out the truth, even imagining the most heteronormative outcome to him trying to murder her. A fucking proposal. First form of female slavery, am I right, boys? Now in regards to Ivy, the first episode sets up her hook, and why she will come to be an even better example for the consequences of compet than Harley herself. Side note 3, Ivy's O finally proves adorable and worth noting on why they should be girlfriends in every universe in my humble gay opinion. Ivy is terrified by the idea of rejection, based on a lot of past trauma that we will discuss later, and yet she is consistently rejected in the first episode by Harley. Ivy understands how the world sees her, in a way Harley perhaps doesn't, so every time Ivy tells Harley she loves her, or shows her such, and then she is rejected, she takes it deeply to heart, and though she loves Harley, it is hard for her to see a way for them to be together that wouldn't see them labelled even more harshly as social deviants, because, well, they are Harley Quinn and Poison Ivy after all. Every time Ivy risks her heart, and it doesn't pay off, she is pulled closer towards the false comfort that fitting in with society could offer, even if that requires sacrificing her values and true parts of herself. Ivy loves Harley, but love isn't always enough, and whilst Ivy can provide stability for Harley, Harley is yet to be in a place where she can offer that to Ivy in return. And, well, they make it pretty clear that Ivy doesn't have any other friends, so... If Harley leaves the first episode feeling more secure in her relationship with Ivy, Ivy is left feeling more vulnerable. And, well, men can smell vulnerable from a mile away. Right, so I'm not saying that Ivy's entire relationship with Kite Boy is actually about Harley, except I kind of totally fucking am. Episode 2 starts our cycle anew, opening on Joker realising that the rest of the rogues gallery now know that Harley broke up with him and not the other way around. And seeing this as a front to his villainy, see also masculinity, Joker decides to falsify the narrative so everyone will believe Joker dumped Harley instead. And being that she is hyper-focused on the opinions of men, Harley is naturally affected by this. And being the queen of chaos she is, she decides she has has something to prove to the Joker and the Legion of Doom. A bunch of men. See? Not even subtle. So shenanigans are shenanigans, and Joker baits Harley into a public show of force. Ivy begs Harley not to fall for said bait, but Harley doesn't listen. She is still defined by how much respect she receives from men, and she equates her self-worth and notoriety with that respect. Harley, like quite literally all of us, was raised pretty succinctly on the idea that her life is worthless unless a man thinks she is hot shit. 
Ivy seems genuinely hurt when Harley chooses to, instead of chilling with her new cool self and the very cool Ivy, pursue validation in a place she will never actually be able to find it. What? No. What are you doing? But Ivy, cupped and maybe living vicariously, is convinced to crash a Legion of Doom party with Harley and spend the whole night defending her from adversaries. Except Ivy has one condition. Fine, just don't leave me alone, or some like D-list villain will hit on me or ask to do a heist with me, and the longer we wait, we- okay, she's gone. Which translates as, I'm only here for you, and I am too vulnerable to be left alone right now. A man will try to take advantage of me. And well, Harley is literally so caught up in her own male-centred worth that she is unable to help Ivy the way that Ivy had helped her. And enter the kite man, harassing Ivy off the pun intended bat. And okay, before anyone dismisses me, I'm just gonna say it. Kite man sucks. This is a kite man call out post. Hashtag kite man is over party. And no, this is not a shipper thing. This is not an angry feminist lesbian thing. That's bigoted and I'm bi. This is a safety thing. Kite man is a straight up creep. Honestly, he is the perfect example of how heteronormative society sets the bar so fucking low for men who date women. The lengths I've seen people, women, queer women even, defend this electro-looking bullsack genuinely horrifies me. Like, dude, why the fuck are you standing that close to a woman you don't even know? Christ, I've met so many men like this. As Rich says in her essay, what if inequality is built into the social conceptions of male and female sexuality, of masculinity and femininity, of sexiness and heterosexual attractiveness. Incidents of sexual harassment suggest that male sexual desire itself may be aroused by female vulnerability. Men feel they can take advantage, so they want to, and so they do. Honestly, other than proving my point about how awful Kite Man is and giving me literal hives, the only good thing Ivy and Kite Man's first interaction gives me is a mirror of, of Ivy's first interaction with Harley. Harley who tries to understand Pam off the bat, versus Kite Man who wears her down because they are both lonely and she is hot and famous. But honestly, this man is so trash that when Ivy rejects him with the help of sarcasm, saying she is just a feeble woman who couldn't possibly help him with a heist, he kind of just accepts that as the fucking truth. But hey, I'll do all the heavy lifting so you don't have to break a nail. It'll be a breeze. Like, he's either dense or a misogynist or both, and I'm not here for it. So to summarise, one, Kite Man is sexist and something conceived in one of Adrienne Rich's nightmares or in a Reddit thread, I'm sure of it. All right, ladies, have fun taking down that beta cut. Two, Ivy's relationship with Kite Man is entirely born out of the fact that she has been rejected or dumped by Harley. Three, harassing a woman when she is vulnerable until she dates you is not the same as consent. Anyway, Harley rescues us and Ivy from that conversation. Because you're stupid! Do you think I'm stupid? I mean, don't you? No, he doesn't think he is stupid. His ego is really that big. Shenanigans continue, with Harley wanting the Legion's respect and Ivy trying to reassure her that she doesn't need it and still managing to not shame Harley for her obvious to us but oblivious to her bullshit. Being straight out of an abusive relationship, Harley is in a weird place and is acting on impulse and anger. Ivy is aware of this and only suggests that they are better than the Legion of Doom and should leave. Obviously, Harley doesn't act on this advice and instead says that even if they don't love me, they will respect me. As if men's opinion on any aspect of a woman's life matters. Alright, fine. Just go. Go steal the money just do me one favor okay don't leave me alone here because i uh. so whilst harley is doing this ha! 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 this is happening to ivy who cannot catch a break i stole your juice and i gave it to these kids hell yeah that potion makes people fall in love with me and then kills them so now ivy is forced to spend time with and require the services of kite man to stop the death of literal children how very convenient for him they arrive back at Ivy's apartment, Kite Man is dumb, and Ivy agrees with me. And then for some truly horrific reason, Kite Man CK decides to get his dick out in the bed of a woman he met an hour ago. And then he has the goal to get upset with her because why bring him back to the apartment if she wasn't going to fuck him, right? So he cries and plays the victim and makes Ivy feel bad for his rapey fuck up, even saying he misread the signals. No, you emphatically ignored her rejections because you do not respect her as a person. Like, honestly, I thought at this point in the episode it might have been revealed that Kite Man had taken some of the potion too, hence his total fucking creepiness, and he was about to turn into a tree too, and she'd have to save him, but no, he's just a pervert, and Ivy only likes him when he literally doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. I hope me taking off my clothes didn't come across as... Creepy? It did. It did indeed. Right. Yeah. So the second episode concludes with the Legion of Doom trying to kill Harley. Harley preaching to them the advice that Harley has been giving her. Bane, why are you letting him talk to you like that? In fact, why did any of you let him talk to you like that? He doesn't even have powers! 
and she convinces the Legion of Doom to essentially turn on the Joker, who in turn tries to kill Harley three times, but Ivy always intervenes. <laughs> And again, the metaphors go so hard in this scene that Kite Man keeps interrupting them, Joker literally tries to force Harley to see she is nothing without him, and Harley herself literally cannot see Ivy or her advice properly until Joker is out of the picture. When she does take Ivy's advice and they end up home, and clearly Ivy thinks they have made progress by episode's end. So, do you realise now that you don't have to prove to anyone how awesome you are? But that is not the case. Harley may have put to one side her need for Joker's respect, but now she wants Lex Luthor's and the Legion's. So these first two episodes do well to set up Harley and Ivy for the rest of the show. Their arcs, their dynamics, and their foils. It also sets up this infuriating but well-written cycle that Ivy and Harley fall into. Harley, seeking the validation of Joker, devalues her relationship with Ivy, and sometimes Ivy herself, with frankly all the obliviousness of a woman fresh out of an abusive relationship. This leaves Ivy on the peripheral, as part of Harley's ensemble, so Ivy begins to fill the holes in her life with other, sometimes kite-shaped things, because she has no one else. And the catch with Ivy is that she may not ever acknowledge it, she may even refuse to see it entirely, but she is just as much of a victim of the patriarchy as any other woman, especially Harley. While she doesn't want Harley to suffer at the hands of a male-identified existence and is willing to point out how sexism could affect Harley... Alright, so look, there's a glass ceiling for female supervillains, okay? Like, sure, we're tolerated, but as long as we don't get too powerful. Aren't you being a little dramatic? Guess whose naive ass hasn't heard of the Queen of Fables? And whilst Ivy still believes the fight against patriarchal bullshit is a worthy cause for Harley to fight, she has practically given up herself. Ivy talks a lot of talk, but is also, like, super depressed, maybe. Often it can leave Ivy's advice feeling a little hypocritical. But here is the thing about feminism. It really is much easier in theory. Also, a woman's feminist ideals at any given point are not inherently tied to her feelings of self-worth or value. Ivy isn't trying to act in hypocrisy when she encourages Harley, or discourages Harley, from any given thing, and then does that thing herself. Ivy truly believes that if anyone can defeat patriarchal and archaic norms, it's Harley fucking Quinn. Ivy just a wants Harley to do these things because she wants to, and not simply to one-up Joker, b does not necessarily see herself as worthy of wanting those freedoms on a personal level, and c she can see how Harley's anarchic behaviour will leave Harley being further labelled as deviant by society, a society that already rejects her. Ivy is scared, and this fear of all-out rejection continues to haunt her throughout the show, in a way that shadows the real lived experiences of queer women, that one day you will finally be unmasked. This is where and why Ivy tries to seek comfort in social norms, where she begins to feel like there is less of a place for her by Harley's side. The old head versus heart debacle. Harley is a shining screaming metaphor for everything Ivy wants and everything that terrifies her. She stands morally with Harley, but she sees herself as unworthy and incapable of living Harley's eccentric lifestyle, and she also does not want to risk rejection by Harley again, when Harley, living this eccentric and chaotic life, finds something shinier to focus on. Ivy has little self-worth at this point in the story, and re-involving herself in a society that has rejected her as a child, as a woman, as a great preserver of nature, as a worthy villain, feels easier to succumb to than the truth. That Ivy and Harley are cut from the same cloth. That Ivy too wants what Harley fights for. Ivy constantly sees herself and her future reflected in other people, and she never likes what she sees. And this is all made evident in the show. Every time Harley takes a caper a little too far, and Ivy retreats, even when she has encouraged and supported Harley with said caper. She is genuinely more scared of society's rejections than her goddamn soulmates because the girl is that messed up by men. Not to be dramatic, but... As the next couple of episodes continue, this desperation of Ivy's gets out of control. Like, she doesn't even like Kite Man, he is just the first person to pay her attention in a long time, if you can call harassment attention. When they first start hooking up, she lies to her friends about it and quite literally disguises herself to avoid seen associating with him. She is disgusted with him in the beginning, and yet still sees him as a more viable option than Harley. A hidden relationship with a man you hate is better than admitting you're queer, I guess. I pretend like I'm this like badass who doesn't care what people think, but... But you do. Right, which is why I said I pretend. So, yeah. Like in life, girl is lonely, boy oversteps, girl turns him down, boy ignores her and makes her feel bad for him, and she gives in. And that cycle, like all other shitty cycles, continues for now. We accept the kite men we think we deserve. Side note three, this show heavily relies on the theme of change, and when writing characters whose arc centre on change, you kind of have to have them be a bit stagnant in the first place. In 
In episode 8 of the first season, Harley and Ivy have their first real fight since the show began. And yes, it is almost entirely to blame on the men who meddle in their lives and hide their intentions in order to create chaos between Harley and Ivy for their own gain. Now granted, Harley and Ivy did need to express some of this stuff, perhaps not all of it, and perhaps not quite under these circumstances that were quite perfectly created by a gang of terrible blokes, but yeah. You're trying to sabotage me instead of confronting the fact that without me, you don't have a single friend in this world. Uh, I don't need this shit. Long story short, Harley is finally invited to one of the lot's shindig. However, the whole thing is essentially just a ploy by Lex to get Ivy into the lot. When Ivy figures out said plan and rejects Lex, he gives her an ultimatum. After this, knowing Ivy is probably just going to tell Harley of his ploy, Lex uses Harley's abusive relationship against her and tries to outwit Ivy by announcing that Harley can join the lot just as Ivy is about to fill her in on Lex's entire plan. And well, Harley reacts like this. Hey, thanks for believing in me. No, I... I, I was just trying to protect you. Blinded still by her need for men's respect, Harley cannot see the vast and self-sacrificing love Ivy has for her, accusing Ivy of sabotaging her when the only person sabotaging Harley right now is Harley and the Lord and Joker. But not Ivy is my point. Ivy knows Harley is better than all of these fucking guys. Harles, look at this place. I mean, this isn't you. Harley is so messed up by Joker at this point that she not only is willing to lose her friendship with Ivy, but just her entire sense of self. Even when Harley is reminded of her love for Ivy and has the opportunity to apologise, Harley still chooses the Legion of Doom, and more specifically, Joker. Abusive relationships, especially ones involving mental health issues, really are no joke, kids. When this scene happens, Ivy is rejected again, responding in a dramatically gay way, this time without Harley even having to say anything. And Harley doesn't reject Ivy with words here, because she doesn't actually want to reject her again. She just struggles deeply from moving on from seriously toxic shit. It's kind of Harley's thing. And this whole situation continues into the next episode, an episode rather aptly named A Seat at the Table, where we see Harley enter the lot and begin to rekindle some kind of relationship with Joker, whilst ignoring Ivy at an emotional level. In this episode, we see the consequences of this choice and how it plays into Harley and Ivy's relationship going forward, and even more specifically in my opinion, we begin to see the foundations for the entire next season, and the core themes and messages behind this telling of Harley and Ivy's story are fully revealed. So Harley, now fully ordained with Joker's approval, makes an attempt to finally apologise to Ivy for the shit she said when they fought. She acknowledges that Ivy is a great friend, that Harley needs to be a better one, and that Harley would probably be dead without Ivy's help. I do not disagree with that. I mean, I'm glad you're not dead, but... Then she asks Ivy what she can do to prove to Ivy her loyalty and appreciation. A last chance for Harley to prove to Ivy that she will not do what Ivy fears the most. I don't know, it just... It felt like you were so ready to abandon me. I would never do that. And as I mentioned earlier, I worry a lot of this storytelling can get lost when people approach a piece of media without addressing their own implicit biases. This scene is not a casual makeup between straight gal pals. This is a goddamn date, especially to Ivy, and that matters. A date followed by the setup of another date. Damn it, Ivy is blushing. Harley pays the bill. Oh shit! She stood your ass up. No, 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 she just had to reschedule. You know, she ended her text in UG. So I know that she just, you know, she didn't want to reschedule, but she had to, you know, things come up, it's fine. Yeah, this is definitely a date. A date Harley misses because she is distracted by Joker, who is up to his usual kill Harley to escape from the Dark Knight routine. And like, again, I know I have said this, but Harley is in really, really deep with Joker. Their relationship is so toxic, it's literally compared to bathing in acid, and rightly so, it broads all other aspects of Harley's life and sense of self. And this is a real life issue in abusive relationships, and one of the reasons why Harley is so worthy of our forgiveness, and is admired by people in her life, and loved by us, the audience in general. Harley may have made choices in her relationship with Joker, but almost all of them were born out of his manipulation and coercion. Harley may be capable of being a dick, but she is not always to blame, and she is more than worthy of redemption. The UN recently found that bisexual women are most at risk from intimate partner violence, and are also more likely to struggle with mental health issues than their straight, gay, and lesbian peers. Which, I don't know, seems like it might be a relevant thing to mention, I guess? Rich also talks about these issues involving abuse in her compa essay, quoting a writer by the name of Susan Schechter, who said the following in the year 1979. The push for heterosexual union, at whatever cost, is so intense that it has become a cultural force of its own that creates battering. The ideology of romantic love and its jealous possession of the partner as property provide the masquerade for what can become severe abuse. Jumping back into the episode, Joker is trying to use Harley as a human shield against Batman again, and even though we are literally flashing back to the first episode, Harley is unable to see the repeat in history, so she falls for it and is saved by Bat. 
When she gets back to Ivy and the crew, they know she was with Joker, and they're upset. Ivy leaves and attempts the heist without Harley and is nefariously captured. Remember that time she said she didn't want to do a heist with Kite Man or anyone, but she spent this entire episode trying to do one with Harley? Shakespearean, honestly. And Look at how intricately woven this storytelling shit is! Peabody award level shit here! With everything kind of going terrible at this point for Harley, with the gang all split apart, it could almost feel like we have reverted back to the beginning of the show, but that isn't the case, and Harley is about to prove it by facing some more of her heteronormative demons. See, it seems Harley's trauma related to compet, the rule of men, and general patriarchal scars do not begin and end with Joker. <laughs> After a particularly revealing conversation with Harley in her past slash inner self, Harley returns to her hometown and the home of her parents. And it goes, um, really, really fucking terribly. What do you mean, Grandma? Well, I went to the doctor last week. I got the brain cancer. Ah! Not sure how much longer I got, so let's drink! <laughs> I tried so hard to get you to change your life in the most passive-aggressive way possible. And we come to learn that, of course, Harley's parents are truly disturbing people who have groomed her from childhood to respond to violence over affection, to accept treating someone like shit is fine if you tell them you love them, leading her to walk openly into the Joker's arms with only this twisted vision of life to defend herself with. Which very much leads back to the point Adrienne Rich makes in relation to how women of all cultures and birth are indoctrinated to validate, excuse, and even seek out these kinds of relationships with men because of the restraints of heteronormity and their childhoods. <laughs> I wanted was what every Jewish mother wants for you to marry a doctor. But I am a doctor! Here's an idea why not both? This episode might be one of the most fucked up moments in the entire show, and, and though it does really well to truly remind you of, of why Harley is so relatable, I'm not going to dwell on it long. Harley's parents essentially spend the entire episode trying to fuck her over, ultimately culminating in them trying to kill her, and when given the choice for revenge, Harley decides not to kill them. She chooses to not turn into them, not accept that hatred will make her stronger, and walks out of their lives forever. Harley chooses to leave the weight of her childhood trauma and relationship with Joker at her parents' door, and no longer perpetuates that cycle of abuse. Instead, when Frank shows up and tells her Ivy needs help, she is ready to go save her. Not that Ivy isn't already trying to save herself because she is still boss. Uh, don't worry! There's any plants around, she's just another weak, helpless woman! Uh, who still has hams and the goddamn Second Amendment. Obviously, I support background checks and common sense gun laws. Ready to accept that she needs her crew, especially if she is going to save Ivy, Harley does an apology tour, and, and though the team doesn't really forgive her just yet, they can all agree that they love Ivy enough to come. And again, stuff happens, Ivy is poisoned with a special maid just for her mix of Scarecrow's fear toxin, and the gang decide to try and save her by entering her brain via Psycho, the way they did with Harley earlier in the season. And here is where we get our first definitive look into Ivy's mind. As I said earlier in the video, Ivy is scared all the time, and that fear creates her motivation. With Ivy's constant need to put up a wall between her and others. This is also the first time Harley and the crew see how this fear has manifested within her. Side note, I know I've said it, but the writing in this show is really good. Both Ivy and Harley's arcs are well plotted and align perfectly at certain moments in the show. Harley's being rooted in agency versus control and Pam's being about acceptance versus shame. These arcs are honestly so tight I could probably plot graph them. Anyway, we enter Ivy's head and are shown a collection of her worst fears, with each fear supposedly worse than the last. The first is the pretty standard last march of the Ents. The second is more interesting, giving us a glimpse into Ivy's childhood for the first time. And it's pretty grim. Much like Harley's background, Ivy's father is a cruel piece of shit, and her parents are generally abusive, also trying to force her to fit into a pretty rigorous mould that is not made for her. Harley obviously cannot save Ivy from her childhood trauma, and another of Ivy's fears rears its head. The surface level explanation for what we see is the death of Kite Man, and subsequently, the thought of having to face death itself. Except, it's revealed that the Grim Reaper is actually Harley. Now to find out how gross your face is! <gasps> oh, shit! Dear God. So it seems Harley herself is Pamela Isley's greatest fear. Let's pigeonhole this for a minute and continue with the episode. I, why am I your biggest 
fear. Harley, I can't talk about this right now. Hijinks continue and everyone, including Ivy, is back in reality and causing chaos on the newly named and designed Harley Quinn Highway. And Harley is upset by the reveal that it seems she is her closest friend's biggest internal nightmare. It's some old school entering the underworld character growth. Ivy doesn't want to talk about it and this continues for a while until Ivy confesses what she believes to be the reason Harley is her so-called greatest fear. Oh, fine! You want to know what my biggest fear is? Finally allowing myself to count on someone and then having them ditch me back to Compet and Shrinking Ivy. Ivy is right that her biggest fear is abandonment, and whilst it is easy for the audience and Ivy to lay a lot of that at Harley's door, Harley is not the only thing that Ivy is scared to lose. It goes far deeper than that in my opinion. Going back to the scenes where we see Ivy's fears, she is not scared that Kite Man will die, but instead that Harley, or what Harley represents, will destroy her chance at a typical life with him. There is a loss for Ivy here wherever she looks. If she does trust Harley and go deep with her, romantically or whatever, Ivy feels she will have to jeopardise everything else in her life. Kite Man represents this. And Ivy's relationship with Kite Man is surface level for a multitude of reasons, but this one most of all. She is only with him because she has convinced herself that he will never leave. Ivy is terrified that she will commit herself to Harley, who she loves and trusts, and forsake everyone else, only to be left in the lurch when Harley leaves her for whatever patriarchal fancy she gets distracted by. You were my one friend, and I asked you for one favor, but instead you ditched me for the Joker who treats you like shit! And so much of this is about Ivy's internalized homophobia and her fear, and all queer people's fear, of ostracization and rejection, which is of course a direct consequence of living within the constraints of compulsive heterosexuality. Look, I have BPD and I'm queer, so trust me when I say that this constant overlap between the fear of personal rejection and the fear of social rejection, dismembering your personality until you are unrecognisable, is definitely a real thing. And Ivy's fear of queerness and her own sexuality is something I will centre a lot on when we talk about season two. The only place Ivy feels capable of hiding away from all of this truth is with a man so egotistical, so one note, so focused on what she can offer him that he doesn't even notice she's doing it, for now at least. A lot of this kind of gets left hanging for a moment whilst plot things happened. The Lod poisons the water supply with ivy juice and creates giant monster trees. The Justice League show up and they have a whole moment. The Queen of Fables reappears and she has a whole moment. And then the crew gets stuck on a cloud, so Ivy has to call Kite Man for help. What's that? I'll head right over. Uh, I, I love you. She didn't say it back. We see that Ivy hasn't told Harley that she is seeing Kite Man. Or maybe Harley hasn't asked. The issue here really isn't Kite Man. He is a non-entity, a goddamn piece of furniture. This is about, using Harley's own words, what Ivy feels like is months of emotional neglect. I wasn't even trying very hard to keep it a secret. Pam, that is a fucking lie. We touch upon something here that Rich calls a woman's double life. A woman may find herself in a romantic relationship with a man for a variety of non-romantic reasons, including, but not limited to, economic safety, social status, and motherhood, etc. But this figurative woman is actually a lover of other women, but cannot risk alienation from society, or simply does not have the means to stand alone. Rich argues that if women loving women choose to live authentically, then they are at greater risk of backlash and violence than gay men, because of the crossover between gender oppression and homophobia. So maybe the damage is done, right? Maybe Harley is impulsive and deviant and unruly. Like, sure, Ivy doesn't really love Kite Man, but he doesn't have the power to hurt her like Harley does. Normies would respect her if she was with Kite Man, right? They'll stop talking about her behind her back. Right now, they will think she's Poison Ivy, lesbian man-hater, the mistress of misandry. Wouldn't she be proving the whole world correct if she embraced life with Harley? We enter the last few episodes of the first season with a plot that revolves around Joker trying to fuck over Harley in any way he can. Kite Man proposing to Ivy, even though she would rather face death than him. Ivy saving Gotham, and then, well, Joker kills Ivy because he knows it will hurt Harley more than anything, and even he knows how gay these two are. And so, yeah, Ivy is shot by Joker and dies in Harley's arms, just having saved her life like she's Steve fucking Trevor or something. And sorry, ew, when they bury Ivy, Kite Man says, Bye, my dear fiance. Even though she never said yes, this man is the worst. A furious and vengeful Harley, thinking that revenge on Joker is the only thing she can do for Ivy at this point, does just that. First she tries using Batman as bait, with his help, but it doesn't work. The only thing that does work, because this is Joker we are talking about, is Harley pretending that she is going back to him, that she is subservient. Which she does, and then subsequently takes the opportunity to shank him as many times as she can manage. Fuck you! 
This is for Ivy. Joker then overpowers Harley and tries to acid her again. But Ivy, who has now been resurrected by the rejuvenating power of nature, or maybe Harley's friendship tears, fucking kills him, finally. Harley and Ivy make up. They tell each other how much they love each other. And with the gang back together, Gotham burning and all foes defeated for now, the first season comes to an end. The second season of the Harley Quinn animated show begins by centering on a chaotic Gotham, with Joker, Batman, the Justice League, and the Legion of Doom gone or scattered. Ivy is trying to convince Harley to embrace her newfound freedom and take charge of Gotham while it's up for the taking. Ivy is living a little vicariously again here. Harley, this is what's gonna happen if you don't take control. Harley is a natural anarchist, but Ivy manages to convince her that anarcho-communism is a much more viable political structure. This is New Gotham. The power isn't held by the few. It is up for grabs. Capers happen, shit goes sideways, Harley is frozen for two months, she kills the penguin, there is some gay stuff, things are somehow bad again, and there is little time for our characters to think. I mean, damn, Ivy got shot twice trying to save Harley. Turns out the crew need Harley as much as she needs them. The city is carved into New Gotham, where every remaining rogue gets a piece. Batman is alive, and Harley decides it's time to murder everyone with Ivy's full support. When I'm done, Gotham is gonna be mine! Cool. They start with Riddler in the next episode. In the midst of taking him down and accidentally helping to create Batgirl, we begin to see Harley's resentment for Ivy's relationship with Kite Man begin to surface when he appears as a taxi service again. We see Harley being jealous of Ivy's relationship with a man not worth her in the same way Ivy did with Harley and Joker. Oh my god, fucking gross. By the third episode, this animosity ramps up and well... I think you can do better than Kite Man. Wait, haven't we heard this before? All I'm saying is, is that you can do way better than Joker. Now, let's reflect for a moment and remember why we are here in the first place. As I previously touched on, one of the things Rich mentions in her essay on Compare, something that she quite honestly gets politely irate about, is how women's relationships with each other become centred on men, and how this affects how women choose to interact with each other, how women are only given the language and tools of our oppressors to communicate with each other. And it isn't just Rich. French feminist philosophy discussed this idea a lot back in the 70s, and most of it still holds true. The above comparison of Harley and Ivy telling each other that they deserve better feels like such a great example of this to me, each unable to translate how they truly feel, and instead they use male-centred language to express how they feel about each other. Honestly, for both of these examples, you could do better may as well be fronted by I know you can't be with me, but... Harley and Ivy's relationship really begins to change at this point in the story, with this conversation even, and a lot of things begin to be said between them that hold a pretty significant amount of weight. They begin to see each other for better and for worse. After walking in each other's shoes for a while, Harley, as righteous and jealous as Ivy was this time last season, and Ivy being defined by a heteronormative relationship with a dude who offers her nothing. And no, Ivy isn't a heterosexual, she's bi, but being a bisexual woman in a relationship with a man who doesn't know about your sexuality is genuinely dangerous, and yet bisexual people still manage to be the members of the LGBT community most likely to be closeted. We hit on Ivy's hypocrisy again here, her expectations for herself and for Harley and how they differ. Now, like I said, a lot of this comes from Ivy's abandonment issues, sometimes but not always connected to the heteronormative expectations of her life. Ivy consistently, and a little obtusely, expects things from Harley that she cannot, or will not follow through with on herself, sometimes even hiding her own dumb decisions between Harley's loud guys. Yeah, you have to commit to the first guy who's nice to you. Uh, your ex-boyfriend tried to kill you several times. Yeah. There is a definite air of, well, you had your chance in this scene. I mean, spoiler alert, but we know Ivy is burying her head in the sand with this whole monosexist triangle bullshit. Ivy has been talking at Harley for a whole season, and now it's her turn to listen, and she doesn't. And yes, some of this is mildly warranted, being that Harley has not exactly been known for having the best judgement, and has not exactly been reliable. At this point, I'm ready to just bang their heads together, really. Maybe you just don't know what it's like to be treated well by someone who truly loves you. Harley does know that kind of love that they say she doesn't. She receives it from Ivy, and she receives it often, when they are not distracted and separated by a desperate need to impress boys. Come on, lady, step out of it! You can't let some boy do this to you! You're an Amazon warrior! You're Wonder Woman! You're literally a symbol of female empowerment! Luckily, the voice of reason, as always, Selena Kyle shows up to whip them into shape, and we are treated to this scene. Wow, just like that? Do you really like this jacket, or are we just saying that you did? What do you think? What do you think? What's happening? Which is just more proof that Ivy is a gay disaster who is desperate for friends, in my opinion. Like, it genuinely makes me a little sad. Ivy, she just stole your favourite jacket. I know, but it looks so much better on her. 
So in this episode, which is again aptly and maybe rather cruelly named Trapped, the story of Ivy settling into a loveless marriage continues. And even though she ignored him the first time and hasn't mentioned it for over two months, Kite Man decides to propose to Ivy again, which he gets a grilling from Harley over. Are you sure Ivy wants to take this next step with you? Maybe take a lesson from the slow cooker and let that shit simmer, huh? Whilst Ivy gets one from Selena. A chauffeur, you must be doing well. Gotham City Sirens say fuck Kite Man rights. And this episode focuses a lot on Ivy's journey so far and how she feels about it. Selena tells Ivy she thinks she has changed but Ivy thinks maybe for the better, and they debate about it all episode. And this theme comes up again and again over the next few episodes, how Ivy balances her role as Poison Ivy eco-terrorist, and her role as simply Ivy, typical citizen and friend. What's the last thing you did for the environment? Well, when's the last time you stole a jewel? Girl, please. I'm never not stealing jewels. And all of this loops back to what I said earlier about Ivy's double life, about wanting to have her cake and eat it a little bit, which I know is really easy for people to disregard as bisexual indecision or greed, but it really is related to trauma and fear. Ivy struggles with the roles Harley and Kite Man play in her life, how they can impact her career, and how either one of them could individually sedate or encourage that part of herself. Selena, a wind-up as ever, makes the argument that Ivy, having any attachments, is a hindrance of her goal to kill people that fuck with nature. Kite Man proposes again, and it's just awkward as hell. There's a special question that I've been waiting to read about. Oh. And then Ivy is literally imprisoned with all of her imposing issues and has a panic attack. Kite Man, being egotistical and awful as usual, continues to annoy Ivy, even though she is clearly in distress and they are all about to die. And Ivy ends up yelling at Harley because Kite Man is a little bitch who doesn't understand the definition of girls' night. And by the end of the episode, Ivy is giving in to a drunk, gross Kite Man because Harley gave her the okay. He grows on you, right? Yeah. Yeah, like a tumour. What else can Harley do here? Risk losing Ivy? She wants Ivy to be happy. Honestly, given how this talk with Hailey and Ivy goes, what exactly is Ivy saying yes to here? I mean, Kite Man offers her nothing. He doesn't know anything about who she is. But today, he risked his life to get you that diamond you wanted. I didn't want that diamond. Yeah, I know, it's totally not your taste. It's too whimsical. Far too whimsical. It's Harley that changes, offers Ivy the comfort and assurance that she needs, who knows Ivy cares more about dead CEOs than a piece of tacky jewellery. It is not a loving relationship that Ivy is saying yes to. It is goddamn settling. Like, how much convincing they both need at this point makes for truly uncomfortable viewing. Quick, dude, before she changes her mind again. And it's hard for me to ignore the sexism and ableism that comes with this. Harley is seen as the crazy chick, and Ivy hides behind this so-called lack of stability of Harley's because it makes for an easy shield from the truth. Harley is consistently undermined because she suffers from mental health issues, even though she is no more or less clinically diagnosable than any other dickhead in Gotham. Again, not inherently and always related to combat, but neither separate from it. The treatment of neurodivergent queer women is gross, and it is my goddamn feminist duty to mention it. And we continue with the Harley Quinn animated series being a particularly on-the-nose look at the restraints of heteronormative living and how women's interpersonal relationships are damaged by men in their lives, with an episode that focuses, amongst other things, to the harm done to Harley's ability to understand what love looks like. Harm done by the Joker. Love is bullshit! I will never forgive Joker for the damage he's done to your heart. Making you give up on love was perhaps his greatest crime of all. So yeah, add this episode to my point about how Ivy is madly in love with Harley from the beginning of this show, and Harley is goddamn oblivious to it. Partly because Ivy is a woman, and partly because she has been taught to look for love in all the wrong places with all the wrong people. And Psycho says this, he could do better. confirming that if you also think Kite Man deserves better, then you're probably as much of a misogynist as this guy. That really hurt, you c- Sorry, I don't make the rules. And our oblivious Harley continues to be oblivious when she fails to recognise how drastically her relationship with Ivy could change when Ivy marries weddings. Kite Man. Me and Ivy have so much fun at weddings. We get so shit faced, we puke, make fun of all the dumb couples, make the DJ play since you've been gone until a dad tries to fight us. Cut to Kite Man being a uh, bridezilla because this show likes to play around with your bullshit sexist notions, and this is a great play on the trope where a bride doesn't want to focus on the cracks in her relationship, so she dives into hyper focusing on the wedding itself instead, so that the entire house of cards that is said superficial relationship comes crushing down around her on her wedding day. Except, you know, this time it's Kite Man. Also, do Harley and Ivy know that they both have separately planned their wedding? All we need is a dance floor, booze, and Kelly Clarkson's greatest hit, we could do it anywhere. 
Back with Harley and the crew, plot stuff has happened and they are caught up in a situation with Mr. Freeze. You've condemned her to death. You better hope your friend Ivy can find the cure, or I'm going to blow this entire place up and kill us all. And we get an entire sequence where Harley learns how jaded she has been about the concept of real love and how she fails to recognise it. She fucks up massively with the freezes because she believes God and love are both dead. Did I misread the situation? Yes. But I've, if you'd seen him feed her soup, you would have done the same. And can we blame her? We've all seen the Joker. We all watched the episode with her parents. So Harley fucks up and gets herself into accidental trouble again. And Ivy comes to her rescue in the middle of Kaiman's dentist appointment or whatever it is. Ivy saves the day and the gang and Harley learns the value of true love and realised that it might be something that she wants in her life. I've never seen truer love than that. Damn, that's nothing like what Joker and I had. I guess that would be kind of nice. Oh, don't be too hard on yourself. We've all been in toxic relationships that skewed our thoughts on love. Leslie. We see once again that Ivy likes fixing people and things so she can avoid fixing herself. Kite Man is almost not a dick, but of course he didn't mean- I realized something today. It doesn't matter where we get married. The only thing that matters is that I get to marry you. I don't even care about the vi- I knew my selfless gesture would be rewarded. Uh, it's just like the end of a rom-com. Oh, and then we get an entire episode of Batman, which includes this incredible cold open, which pretty much sums up my entire point of this video in like 10 words. The sixth episode of the second season is a pivotal one, and one that I think summarises a lot of what I've been discussing. It is also, in my opinion, another one of the best episodes of the show. Side note number... I don't know or care anymore. This episode, as far as I can tell, is named after an episode of Lost, which, not important, gun to my head, is my favourite show ever. This episode of Harley Quinn is called All the Best Inmates Have Daddy Issues, and season one, episode 11 of Lost, it's called All the Best Cowboys Have Daddy Issues. Not only do these two episodes share what Lost is probably most famous for, its use of flashback, they also share a narrative that focuses on, well, daddy issues, the ethics of doctors with mental health issues, manipulation, messed up memories, the parts of ourselves we choose to hide, the false narratives we forge for ourselves, and whether or not people can change. Both episodes are mid-season episodes that are full of reveals that directly impacts the second half of the season. We also see how insidious the main villains can and have been. Not that this is a GCSE lit comparison, but the lost metaphor only continues in the next couple of episodes when Harley and Ivy are quite literally thrown into a hole in the ground and have to face parts of themselves that they have been avoiding. I honestly have no idea how purposeful any of this was, but I'm mentioning it. Anyway, in this episode, Harley and Ivy realise that Joker, who they thought had died at the end of season one, is alive. Babe, I'm telling you it's not him. Oh, fuck. It's him. And having been pushed into acid is the un-Joker now. Ivy, always the jealous girlfriend and anointed destroyer of abusive scum, decides that they should finish the job and just kill the bastard. Do you think he saw us? Oh, I hope he saw us, because I want him to see the face of his murderers. However, Harley, ready to turn over a new leaf, pun very much intended, recognises that Joker may not be Joker anymore. He might just be a boring bar boy now, in which case, maybe they shouldn't murder him. Ivy argues that that would require the Joker to have changed, and people can't change. And well, we get into the crux of the episode. Harley responds saying, You're wrong, and I can prove it. We go back to Harley's first day at Arkham, where she is suffering from blatant misogyny and meets the two people most formative in her adult life. No, not those two. Harley has been called to Arkham to help get information out of Joker, who she wrote a paper on. The info they need being the whereabouts of a bomb that the Joker has hidden in Gotham and that is going to go off at any second. We then see Harley and Ivy's first interactions, where Harley pretty instantly tries to defend, protect, and connect with Ivy. Ivy does this. Fuck off, narc. And then we see Harley's first interactions with Joker, where he does the usual branding her with names and threatening to kill her bit. As the episode continues, when nothing has worked in regards to getting information out of the Joker, Harley seeks help from Ivy, and they have their first proper conversation, which, yes, is about Joker, but is also about trust. And this plays off a lot in the long run. Kill Joker, kill people, kill yourself. God, Ivy is great. So Ivy gives Harley some info on Joker she picked up on in group therapy. He won't talk about his family. With this information, Harley thanks Ivy and heads to mindfuck Joker, only to get mindfucked by him in return. With Harley thinking she is getting one over on Joker, he tells her a story of his childhood that he uses to explain and excuse his behaviour. It involves wealthy and neglectful parents and focuses on a night he caught his dad fucking the maid, his dad killing his pet ferret the next day and beating the crap out of him. I found Ferris's cage empty and daddy above it with the widest smile I'd ever seen. 
That day my father took away the one thing I'd ever loved. Then he beat the shit out of me. And yes, Harley isn't in on it yet, but this is all a ploy on the Joker's behalf so he can escape later. We have another gay scene with Harley and Ivy involving flowers. I could kill you with this. Yeah, you could. and we see Ivy begin to warm up to Harley. So the Joker's bomb is actually in Arkham the whole time. The place that he told Harley was a lie and he blows a hole in the wall and escapes, kidnapping Harley in the process. He thinks he can get away with using her as a human shield, but... Take the shot. Sir, I can't without hitting her. Who gives a fuck? Enter Ivy, who comes to save Harley's life for the first of many times. Ivy, you saved me. Say what? I always oh, knew you God. had a special place in your heart. Uh, not you, asshole. <laughs> Harley and Ivy have another nice moment where again we see Ivy Brighton choosing not to escape Arkham in order to keep Harley safe and this is the root of the change we can see in Ivy in the prominent timeline. This one small act of kindness, one little plant. Back in the present, Harley believes she has proved her point. Even if Ivy cannot see that Harley has changed, she must be able to recognise it in herself, right? Ivy, you said humanity wasn't worth saving, but then you saved me. A human. Even though it meant another year in Arkham. I mean, thusly... Don't say thusly. I changed you, which proves your core can change. Harley wins again! God, you're so smug. Ivy argues that she wasn't changed by Harley. That Ivy wasn't born fucked up like Joker. Harley helped Ivy, but Ivy wasn't born full of hatred for humanity. Humanity hated her first, and the the thing is, neither of them is necessarily wrong here. Harley just doesn't have all the information. Mr. Ferris? You mean Joker's Ferris? No, I mean Mr. Ferris, the ficus. He was my first plant. I don't understand. Harls, that was my story. I told it in group therapy. Joker probably just stole it and weirdly changed it to a ferret. What? Well, as always, Joker lied, surprising no one but you. The first time my father hit me, that's when I gave up on humans. Until I met you. The episode wraps up with Psycho confirming that Joker is now un-Joker and Harley and Ivy decide not to kill him and leave the bar closer than maybe they have ever been in a while, only to be captured by Harvey Dent as they leave the bar arm in arm. Okay, so if it isn't obvious yet why I love this episode so much and why I think it is important to the show's narrative and my general exposition here, let me explain. At what point did my life go Looney Tunes? Okay, so the idea of Joker telling Harley a false backstory in order to manipulate her is not unique to the Harley Quinn animated series. In fact, it is the mad love origin of their relationship and the first tactic he uses to control her. He makes her feel sorry for a broken boy, not a messed up man. Every time I got out of line, bam! Oh, sometimes I'd be just sitting there doing nothing. Pow! He told me things, secret things he never told anyone. Was it his line about the abusive father? Or the one about the runaway mom? He's gained a lot of sympathy with that one. Stop it! You're making me confused! Some things never change, Quinn. Joker wants Harley to think he is capable of change, which he isn't, at least not in regards to her. We see how Joker and Harley's relationship begins, unbalanced and based on fear, in direct comparison to Harley building trust with Ivy at the same time. Harley is not wrong for being empathetic, and this change in the narrative solidifies this. This person had a crappy life, and though childhood abuse is not an excuse for shitty behaviour, it can help to source, rationalise and explain it, especially if you are quite literally trained in the science of understanding people's inner workings. Call me dumb, I have a PhD, motherfucker. If Joker can love that ferret and mourn for it when it's taken away from him, how could he not have the same capacity to love Harley? Except the town ferret isn't a ferret, it's a ficus, and Ivy is the one with the great capacity for love. Changing this huge part of Harley's relationship with Joker and reworking it into Harley and Ivy's story is chef's kiss, and it achieves a lot. You strip Joker of a certain power he has over Harley. We see how much she fundamentally misunderstands the level of manipulation she has suffered, without Harley ever having to revert back to her old ways like we see at the end of Mad Luck. We see that the person Harley fell in love with, the child she wished to protect, was Ivy all along. And better still, Ivy doesn't ever use her shitty backstory to justify her actions and motives, even when she probably should, nor does she brand her trauma as a weapon against Harley intentionally. Joker does choose to use a woman's trauma as a weapon though, and not not just with Harleys now either, apparently, so fuck that guy. Like, Christ, this show is so good at angry feminist subtlety, you just have Joker out here literally appropriating women's history. Harley and Ivy are once again blind to their connection and common ground because they are unable to see each other as anything but friends, and friends aren't as good as lovers, and lovers must be men. Rich, in her essay, says that women identification is a source of energy, as potential springhead of female power, violently curtailed and wasted under the institution of heterosexuality. The denial of reality and visibility to women's passions for women, women's choices of women as allies, life companions and community, the forcing of such relationships into dissimulation and their disintegration 
situation under intense pressure have meant an incalculable loss to the power of all women to change the social relations of the sexes, to liberate ourselves and each other. The lie of compulsory female heterosexuality today afflicts not just feminist scholars, but every profession, every reference work, every curriculum, every organising attempt, every relationship or conversation over which it hovers. Now, in these next few episodes, we get good and gay, but also painful and real. When Piper and Alex over here find themselves in trouble and they have to face how they feel about each other romantically head on for the first time, we see Harley begin to realise the things that I have incessantly been ranting about for the last however long. In this episode specifically, we see Harley and Ivy on trial, and Harley trying to take responsibility for all the messes she thinks she has made, trying to rid Ivy of guilt by association, encouraging Ivy to go off and live a life without Harley if that is what will make her happy. I've blame it all on me, okay? You've had my back no matter what stupid messes I've gotten myself into. For once, let me be the one who does something for you. You have a whole life ahead of you. I mean, you're engaged. But you and I are a team. I please, I wouldn't be able to live with myself if you went down for me. Spoiler, this does not make Ivy happy and she takes the fall with Harley every time. Yeah, we did it, okay? We teamed up to kill your pathetic asses because you deserved it. And one day, we're gonna finish the job. <gasps> Ivy! Why the hell did you do that, I? Carlos, I'm not gonna let you rot in prison while I'm kiting around the world on my honeymoon. But no one even knows you're kidnapped! You could've led the rescue! Ivy, please just break up with him for everyone's sake. Harley and Ivy figure none of this will matter anyway when they are sent to Arkham and naturally escape as always. Except, well, they aren't sent to Arkham. So, Harley and Ivy are in a pit, physically and emotionally, and Ivy is having a panic attack because she does not want to be locked in a place where she would have to face her feelings. There's no plants! There's no plants in sight! Oh my god, oh my god, we're gonna be stuck in here forever. I mean, who's gonna protect the rain for us? Swamp thing. Who will defend the Great Barrier Reef? Aquaman. They come up with some plans, and Harley is there to tell Ivy everything is going to be okay and fine, and that she will save her shitty nuclear life if she loves it so much. Because Harley herself is very much realising that all she actually wants right now is Ivy to be happy. And is Ivy happy? Uh, she's definitely made some growth, yeah, but is this someone that is happy? Life's just one big pit that none of us are ever going to get out of. One big fucking inescapable pit, and that is where we are stuck forever. Shit happens, Harley and Ivy cause a riot and get close to escape via Vine X Machina, only for Bane to interrupt them with some well-needed relationship therapy. <laughs> And it kind of works. In this moment, thinking she and Ivy are seconds from death, all Harley wants to do is tell Ivy to be happy, that she loves her, she is ready to die if Ivy can live the life that Harley believes she has ruined. You know I love you. Bye, Ive. But Ivy isn't Joker. She is a grown-ass woman who made a choice to help her friend, and she won't condemn Harley to death for that. So Ivy is able to save Harley, because Harley saved Ivy. And well... <laughs> we did it. <sighs> <laughs> Episode 8 of Season 2 picks up with Ivy and Harley reacting to their kiss, and, well, as usual, Harley is ready to feel all of the feelings, and Ivy is ready to repress that shit far down. Because kissing another girl is crazy, right? They are just two heterosexual friends who are caught up in the intensity of their womanly emotions who should probably get back to focusing on men. I would never want anything to mess up our friendship, you know? Yes, totally, yeah, especially not over some kiss that, you know, didn't even mean anything, <laughs> so... Are you gonna tell Kite Man? No, of course she isn't. You are the grown-up in this relationship now, apparently, Harley. Pocketing Ivy for a moment, let's talk about how Harley almost causes the apocalypse when she isn't allowed to express herself in a healthy way and is made to feel crazy for those feelings. So, Harley decides she needs something to keep her busy. One, because she told Ivy she was busy. Two, because she needs something to distract her from Ivy. And three, she thinks Ivy is off having a cool life without her. And being Harley fucking Quinn, the only thing she concludes is big enough to distract her from Ivy-related feelings is total world domination. Now, everyone and their lesbian bat daughter can see that Harley is clearly ignoring some big emotional thing if she is willing to act like this. Oh, oh yeah, we're gonna have fun. As I become the world's most feared supervillain. That's not you. The gravitas just isn't there. The gravitas is there! But she heads off to Darkseid with the crew anyway. They get to Darkseid, she gets shrunk by Darkseid, because 
even though Alien God knows you're gay. Are you trying to fill an empty hole in your life, Harley Quinn? Well, is this guy my therapist? There are some holes that not even an army of parademons can fill. Definitely not. All my holes are filled up to the brim. <laughs> and virus psycho-evolved technicality, Harley is given a Shira makeover and an army of parademons to remake the world. So Harley is causing chaos and getting called out. Gotham is slowly being ravaged by parademons who are quite literally tearing people apart. And then Ivy shows up, having seen it all. Look, you know me. I mean, I'm ride or die, but I mean, is this really the ride you envisioned? <laughs> What's the end game? What do you really want? And the two of them share a moment for the first time since their kiss. And then Ivy stabs Harley in the chest. And she is my queen. No, I jest. That would be fucking stupid, right? Look, I can explain the whole Game of Thrones Khaleesi thing. Wait, rewind. <laughs> you were right all along, Ive. I should have taken control from the start. Riddler, Two Face, Freeze, Bane. I'm taking them all down. Lannister, Targaryen, Baratheon, Stark, Tyrell. They're all just spokes on a wheel. Oh. Oh, for fuck's sake. Okay, fine. I'll take the bait. Yes, this one episode of the Harley Quinn animated series says more about women's mental health and shows it more respect than eight seasons of Game of Thrones or George R. R. Martin. <sighs> Anyway, people, including Ivy, really have to stop telling Harley she is crazy and then feigning surprise when she acts crazy. Harley really doesn't have the right language to express her feelings for Ivy. All the love she has ever had and ever known has been violent and destructive and dominant. That is the exact opposite of what she has with Ivy. She couldn't even see how she felt for Ivy for years. How can she be expected to know how to express it overnight? Once again, after a good public shaming, Harley is made to face the things that Ivy doesn't want to and admits that she has been guarded and that she does need to talk to Ivy, but then Pipe Man interrupts them and, you know, fuck confessing her love for Ivy to him. We need to talk about what you want to do for your bachelorette party! Really? That's what you wanted to tell me? Yeah! As I said, words are hard for Harley. She is a woman of action. So in an attempt to prove they are normal het friends, Harley organises a nice heteronormative bachelor party. Because nothing says gal pals like a bachelorette party on an island of women organised by your secret gay lover. I'm truly embarrassed for you both. We return to another of those terrible cycles I talk about in this episode, of Harley and Ivy ignoring their feelings. I have never seen you with a clipboard. I mean, I'm, I'm like impressed with it, but it's also kind of freaking me out. It's all for you, poison bridey. <laughs> and then they fuck. I'm your best friend. You are my best friend. When this happens, as when they kissed, Harley is called crazy and batted away, and Harley is not afforded the emotional growth that Ivy expected of Harley in the first season, or that Ivy demands for herself. When Harley does something wonderful for Ivy, or puts Ivy's feelings before her own, she has sent the mixed messages she was dishing out in the first season. However, I would argue that things go a little further this time, not necessarily in behaviour, but in Ivy's words. They sting a bit more than Harley saying that Ivy had no friends. Ivy calls them a mistake. She calls Harley a mistake. She consistently implies that what what they are doing is crazy, the actions of mad women. She tells Harley that she is untrustworthy and that they cannot be together, even though she, Harley, and the entire Galactic Federation know it is a lie at this point. I think we just chalk it up to a crazy moment where something crazy happened. You know what I mean? I mean, that's it. Totally, totally. It was so me. It was Harley Quinn always doing crazy things. Of course, and you know, we don't want it to happen again. I... No, 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 we do not. Never. Obviously, that would be awkward and derail future plans. Plus, you know, there's no room in the itinerary for... The truth is, I trust you with my life, but I don't trust you with my heart. And Ivy can lie all she wants. She can say she doesn't want Harley. I even believe that part of her is truly worried that she will lose her only friend. That is a normal thing to worry about. But the moment she implies that their relationship has anything to do with Harley's perceived social deviance or her mental health, she has become the epitome of what she despises. Queerness and madness have walked hand in hand for centuries, and it has never ended in anything but ableism and torture for women and disabled people everywhere. All of my heroes are dead. To quote Rich, Yet women hatred is so embedded in our culture, so normal does it seem, so profoundly is it neglected as a social phenomenon, that many women, even feminists and lesbians, fail to identify it until it takes, in their own lives, so permanently an unmistakable and shattering form. Lesbian existence is also represented as mere refuge from male abusers, rather than as an electric and empowering charge between women. 
Kathleen Barry, an anthropologist quoted in Rich's essay, has this to say, that the effect of male identification means internalising the values of the coloniser and actively participating in carrying out the colonisation of one's self and one's gender. Male identification is the act whereby women place men above women, including themselves, in credibility, status and importance in most situations. Regardless of the comparative quality the women may bring to the situation, interaction with women is seen as a lesser form as relating on every level. Even Harley can't ignore the root of this problem. Ivy, look. You're here. You're queer. Get used to it. Harley's being made to feel alien, more so than usual anyway, because she is being positioned as wrong in comparison to Kite Man's right, because she is a woman, not a man, because she is mentally ill, because she does not closet herself in the pursuit of social norms. And we know Harley has changed, even if Ivy wants to ignore it because she spends the next few episodes saving the world, dealing with Joker, and not once falling for his bullshit. She even then saves Ivy herself, so she can get married to this. I can't wait to see Ivy. Oh, I wonder what she'll complain about first. Probably the airplane food. God, she is one in a million. Wow, you certainly share a unique connection. God hates things. Woman-loving woman existence comprises both the breaking of a taboo and the rejection of the compulsory way of life. Adrian Rich. Told you I'd come back to this. So, Ivy is absolutely suffering from internalised queerphobia, and when you reflect on this entire show, letting go of some implicit biases you may have innately ingrained within you, I think it's pretty easy to see. Look, I just, I just wanted you to know what you're up against, you know, because I, uh, I love you. Don't make a thing of it. Harley. I love you in, in a very odd, hard to articulate way. In the beginning, she hides it behind Harley's relationship with Joker, with the rationale that she has no reason to act on her queerness. And then she meets Kite Man, and after being rejected by Harley, he's worn her down enough to date him. He presents her with a chance to mask within a society she is forced to partake in that has told her she is wrong. He provides distraction and a false sense of safety that many women for thousands of years have sought. This is common, and it is not the bisexual passing people like to band around. She is literally in the closet. Ivy never discusses this important part of herself with this newfound supposed supportive partner. She doesn't really discuss anything with him. Like, girl, your favourite band is the Indigo Girls. We see the shame intensify in Ivy every time her relationship with Harley deepens, and when she is no longer able to hide this part of herself, she presents with all the cruelty and subtlety of a high school cheerleader caught kissing the goth girl in the bathroom. After her first kiss with Harley, she avoids talking about it and throws herself into a situation she would normally avoid like the plague. She literally spends an entire episode doing the most boring shit with Kite Man and his parents because he literally wants a mother instead of a wife. And then she gets distracted by Harley anyway. To quote Maria San Filippo in the book The B Word, Bisexuality in Contemporary Film and Television, in relation to the bisexual love triangle trope, the romantic erotic triangle, or threesome, can efficiently suggest bisexuality or even act as an indirect mode of conveyance within narratives featuring same-sex desire that goes unacknowledged or unconsummated. In other words, triangles are often time-saving structures that overcome the problem of temporality by allowing for a character's simultaneous exploration of same-sex and opposite sex desire. But because such narratives are often structured around the question of the bisexual character's true, read, monosexual identity, the triangle tends to turn on stereotypical notions of bisexuality as indecisive, as wanting to have it all, as a phase to be outgrown. Now, I don't think the show approaches the trope like this. I think Ivy does. This fear within Ivy, this hiding, only continues later when Harley continues to make it quite obvious how she feels, but Ivy refuses to talk about it or see it. The Ivy who was making Harley self-shrink herself in the first episode of this damn show is now presenting the, that exact behaviour. At one point, Harley is super into making Ivy's bachelorette a good one, and Ivy calls her weird. Like, no, she's in love with you, as you are her, you know this. What is weird is watching Poison Ivy throw her life down the drain in a miserable monosexist marriage. In her essay, Adrian Rich discusses how sexual relationships between women seem to be socially categorised as either exotic or perverse, and Ivy is deeply affected by both of these points in my opinion. In the Bachelorette episode, we see Ivy freak out after her and Harley sleep together, and resort to calling what happens a mistake. And she does this again and again, and then she forces herself to enjoy another heterosexual ritual. She literally, and not even slightly metaphorically, tries to run away from her gay. I need to get out of here. She needs to get out of here. Wait, what? Are you, are you sure? So sorry, but there's no way off the island today. 
The invisible plane is out picking up some investors. Well, is there an invisible boat? Or a visible boat? Is there a fucking fisherman? A trawler? The fact that Ivy and Harley consummate their relationship on Themyscira of all places, whilst tipsy, only arms Ivy with more excuses. The sense of exoticism is quite literally what the Amazons have been used to represent throughout human history. <laughs> what happens in Lesbos stays in Lesbos, I guess. I mean, as soon as she steps off that invisible jet, Ivy can be normal again. She can be straight. Ivy knows Harley can never be these things. Society decided a long time ago that Harley was not welcome. This self-hate incoming out story, this sense of loneliness in queer characters, is a tale as old as time at this point, and it still sucks every time I watch it. Just once, I'd like to watch something where two people fall in love and experience no complications whatsoever. I mean, Ivy can say that Harley will leave her, and that she is incapable of change, but Harley proves her wrong in the next episode, when she spends her entire time saving the Justice League with Joker, and not once thinking about him as anything other than an arsehole. I'll be seeing you soon, Mr. J. This show is wild and great. When we next catch up with Ivy, she is still not having a good time, trying to force her wedding through even though demons are falling through the sky, because it's a lot harder for your boyfriend to leave you when it's revealed you were a gay fiend if you have made that bitch your husband. I mean, it works for the Victorians, why would it not work for Ivy? I mean, if Ivy tells Kite Man now about Harley, and he doesn't see it as the mistake she has tried to convince herself it is, then their entire relationship will be revealed for what it is, a mask that she wears. Absolutely not. I'm ready to move forward with my life and leave some things behind. And if we don't do it right now, those things might catch up with us and we can't have that. And also, like, I want to marry, you know, like, love and marriage. I want to do that thing with you. That was really touching. And honestly, he does start to notice. Ivy may as well be ringing a bell and screaming, I'm here, I'm queer, and I'm terrified every time she enters a room. She takes her groom to her dress fitting because she is that scared of Harley. And again, the most vacant man on the planet can see how weird that is. And if the bringing of the parademons was Harley's reaction to Ivy, then the removal of them centers on Ivy reacting to Harley. I mean, it's actually all Psycho's fault, but whatever. Hey, Psycho, you tiny dicked asshole. I was trying to just sit this one out, but you screwed with my goddamn wedding. So either ground your goddamn parademons until the I do's are done, or so help me. Oh, actually, I'm so happy you came, Ivy. I was really in need of a friend. Now here we really do get treated to a metaphor when not gay Ivy is being forced to confront her secret lover head on by the biggest and most blatant misogynist in the entire show. And so everything comes to a head in an episode that sees Harley and Ivy outed to the world by a sex pest and all of Ivy's fears coming true. On a lighter note, this also happens and it makes me laugh every time I see it. I'm going to save Ivy! Whoa, whoa, whoa. That is a sophisticated piece of cloth in what it took years of training with my sin. And she is soaring majestically. Again, another long story short, a mind-controlled Ivy is rampaging Gotham trying to kill Harley, and Harley and Kite Man come together to save her. Harley does this. I can't let you kill her! I love her more than anything in this whole world! And then Psycho projects Harley and Ivy having sex to the whole city because he is upset a couple of girls kicked his ass. Oh, man. I hate missing inside jokes! Uh, uh, don't worry. I'll tell you. <laughs> Whoa. Oh, this is going to affect the crew dynamic in a messy and complicated manner. I had a feeling the tension was palpable. And this scene, whilst you may find it aesthetically pleasing, is emotionally devastating. To be outed is no joke. To be outed in front of the man you're supposed to marry tomorrow via a projection in the sky from your own memory of you fucking your best friend is worse, definitely. Right before all of this happens, Harley reconveys her feelings for Ivy and asks her to take the risk. And you know what? She might have if this hadn't have happened. When Psycho does what he does, he reduces Ivy's relationship with Harley to a lesbian porno that she did back in the 90s that she doesn't want her boyfriend to find out about. Sex between women reduced to a male fantasy broadcast to the whole world without any context for the emotion that exists between Harley and Ivy. It is simply explicit and shameful. I think here Rich's work can do well to explain Ivy's emotional response to this situation. The 
function of pornography as an influence on consciousness is a major public issue of our time when a multi-billion dollar industry has the power to disseminate increasingly sadistic women degrading visual images but even so-called softcore pornography and advertising depict women as objects of sexual appetite devoid of emotional context without individual meaning or personality essentially as a sexual commodity to be consumed by males so-called lesbian pornography created for the male voyeuristic eye is equally devoid of emotional context or individual personality. The most pernicious message relayed by pornography is that women are natural sexual prey to men and that they love it, that sexuality and violence are congruent and that for women sex is essentially masochistic, humiliation, pleasurable, physical abuse, erotic. But along with that message comes another and here is what I think most relates to Ivy. This message not always recognised, that enforced submission and the use of cruelty, if played out in heterosexual pairing, is sexually normal, while sensuality between women, including erotic mutuality and respect, is queer, sick, and either pornographic in nature or not very exciting compared with the sexuality of whips and bondage. Pornography does not simply create a climate in which sex and violence are interchangeable, it widens the range of behaviour considered acceptable from men in heterosexual intercourse behaviours, which reiteratively of their autonomy, dignity and sexual potential, including the potential of loving and being loved by women in mutuality and integrity. And that is what Psycho does here. He makes Harley and Ivy's love into porn. I know a lot of people seem to have watched this show and felt that Ivy and Kite Man even attempting to get married after this incident is farcical or unlikely. And maybe on his part, but on hers, God no, it just isn't. The shame and terror that this outing inspires in Ivy is biblical. She is out here calling queer love a mistake and calling bisexuality a fling like she is Shirley Phelps. That is how internalised this hatred goes. And I know it is easy for people to understand if a character is, say, a gay man male closeted teenager in a CW show, but people seem less able to empathise with Ivy. And Ivy's behaviour is rough, but it's just another story much like Harley's abusive relationship with Joker, with a woman being so obsessed with fitting in with the accepted social narrative that she hurts herself and everyone she cares about in unimaginable ways. It is hard to see Ivy treat Harley this way, to treat herself this way, even to see Kite Man be treated this way sometimes. And no, the personal feelings of one man do not matter in comparison to an outing and public shaming that will affect all queer women off Gotham, but neither am I entirely devoid of empathy yet. And Ivy takes this shit nuclear when she and Harley have their private discussion on the wedding day, piling on Harley in a way which I have never seen before. Like an animal trapped, she lashes out, scared of Harley's truth, scared of the wedding she doesn't actually want, scared of the fact that everyone knows about her and Harley and she cannot do anything to take that back, and therefore she can no longer ignore it. I mean... Ivy wouldn't even recognise herself if she looked in the mirror at this point, saying things like this with little to no conviction. Just, look, this is supposed to be the happiest day of my life, you know? I mean, that is, if you ascribe to those patriarchal norms about a woman's value fading after she gets chosen by a man. Which we don't, right? Regardless! She is trying to convince herself on every level that lie is truth and truth is lie because she is literally scared of being alienated for it. And she is right to be scared. Almost everyone, including her, has done nothing but segregate Harley who represents all of this queerness. I mean, Ivy fucking tells Harley she is crazy here again, that what they had is wrong and bad. I am trying to save your wedding! Listen how crazy you sound! I'm not! Two-Face told me! Okay, a literal two-faced person told you that. Harls, you may not even know this, but you're looking for any reason to disrupt my life with Kite Man, and I just, I cannot have it. She is literally being homophobic and ableist and sexist, all the things we know she stands in direct opposition to, echoing the dangerous rhetoric of the real world that has led to the rape, torture, and death of queer women globally. This is the woman who has spent the last two seasons trying to help Harley embrace her own feminist narrative. And Harley respects Ivy's decision and boundaries, unlike other people, and leaves Ivy to marry Kite Boy if that's what she wants. She doesn't return until she realises that Ivy and Kite Man's wedding is for real going to be fucked up and that she isn't crazy when she notices Ivy's wedding flowers are fake. Also, the fact that both Ivy and Kite Man missed the fact that the flowers were swapped out for fakes is a perfect example of how neither of them are actually present on this day. Ivy's fear is so deep that even when her vows are a nightmare... Wow, that was a very specific picture that you painted of our future that I had not... <clears throat> I had not totally considered. <sighs> oh, right. I'm up. Sorry. Um, hello. Uh, let me just check my notes. Right. <sighs> and her wedding is blown up, and the guy she is supposed to marry looks like this. Why? 
she's she's still ready to go through with it. Honestly, the only time Ivy looks genuinely happy on the supposed greatest day of her heteronormative life is when she realises Harley stayed to rescue her, and in that moment she sees just how much Harley does for her. Ivy fulfills her own prophecies. So scared to lose everyone, she almost loses everyone. Scared of being rejected by society, she clings to it, unable to find any freedom until it abandons her. Her most daunting fear becomes her only salvation. It is hard to finally admit it, but since you refuse to, I will. I'm not the person for you. No. Oh, shit. Like you said, Ivy, I deserve the best. No, you don't. Goodbye. Thank you for proving my point. The culmination of this arc and all current episodes of this show come when Harley and Ivy are finally free and emotionally capable of being together. For Harley to have changed and for Ivy to see it. Look at you! What you did for me today! You... You showed me the horrors I always wanted to see, you know? Well, you, you, don't, you don't think I'm chaotic and crazy and make a bunch of messes? No, you definitely do that, but you're trying to grow and actually doing it. And that, I mean, for me, that's what matters. For Ivy to accept the parts of herself that she is most terrified of, to stop worrying what everyone else thinks when she is literally the coolest person on the planet. I've been denying a lot of myself for a long time. I guess, I guess it seemed easier for me to just go along with it, you know? And, but now I realize I heard a lot of people delaying the inevitable. The show ends how it begins with the love of Harley and Ivy. I love you, I'm... I love you too, Harley. Adrienne Rich says in her essay that compulsory heterosexuality is most commonly enforced via two broad motions, physical force and control of consciousness. Across this show, we see Harley and Ivy struggle against such notions, with Harley being affected most prominently with the former in her relationship with Joker and the latter being Ivy's bigger issue. Another thing that Rich says, however, is that these forms of male power are breakable, that life outside patriarchal and heteronormative values is possible, that there can be power in a woman-identified existence even whilst being attracted to men, that the continuum of women and queer is vast, and we at some level are all capable of unity as a collective force to raise all women worldwide out of oppression. She says, This lie keeps numberless women psychologically trapped, trying to fit mind, spirit and sexuality into a prescribed script because they cannot look beyond the parameters of the acceptable. It pulls on the energy of such women, even as it drains the energy of closeted lesbians. The energy exhausted in the double life, the lesbian trapped in the closet, the woman imprisoned in prescriptive ideas of the normal, share the painful, blocked options, broken connections, lost access to self-definition, freely and powerfully assumed. There are lots of reasons I love the Harley Quinn animated series, but the focus on this kind of story is the main one. The Harley Quinn animated series is not perfect, but it tries awfully hard to give credence to stories that are very often not seen in the media. A story that is quite often denied to Harley and Ivy themselves within the DC universe. And this matters. Women matter. Queer people matter. Stories matter. Even ones about a plant witch and a crazy clown. And this video was made in honour of that. This isn't an all-out advocacy for political lesbianism or a denouncement of heterosexuality itself. This is not about hate men or about having more shows about women written by men. This is about the stories that deserve to be told at the moment. This show has tried to do the work so many others are yet to, even with Batman involved. As Ivy says herself, a lot of people can get hurt when you deny the inevitable, and the inclusion of sapphic narratives that focus on bisexuality often helps soften the restraints of compulsory heterosexuality and the patriarchy on all of us. So let us hope that we are gifted to a season three of this show, where Harley and Ivy can re-explore themselves as individuals and as a couple where we can see them lived vilified only for their literal villainy and not once again for their love.